so weak in our human nature. We need his healing over and over and over again. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit just to come. I'm going to ask you to surrender whatever it is that he lays on your heart to surrender to him. Jesus is perfect. Jesus' portion is perfect for what you need. He has a portion of unconditional love that's perfect to fill up your loneliness. He has a portion of forgiveness to replace that bitterness. He has his portion of peace to take away the fear and worry. He is able to do anything. And as we sing this again, God, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would work in these hearts of ours. And that you would release us, God. And that you would fill us with your perfect portion of strength and peace and grace.
Today, when we get to celebrate our independence uh, as a country, it's a day when we remember that we were not always a country, but at one time we were colonies of England and uh, colonies that were being taxed without representation, colonies that didn't have control of our own destiny, control, colonies that had a, an ocean between us and the ruling bodies that were imposing things on us that we just couldn't live with. And while our independence was kind of won in a sense on July 4th, 1776, as we uh, kind of published and, and signed the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't like England just said, oh, okay, fine, leave then. 
Uh, what, what began there was a, a revolutionary war that took eight years of, of death and chaos as they, they went through to fight for our independence. And really, it wasn't necessarily settled. They, they kind of wondered, how was this going to turn out? There were ebbs and flows. There were wins and there were losses. But eventually, we won the war and we were declared a sovereign nation and England signed a peace treaty with us. In fact, it was kind of the Revolutionary War was actually more of a, a world war. Uh, France and Spain and all of those countries were involved in it in, in various ways. But in Paris, eight years after 1776, they signed a treaty and our, our new country was born. And it was a country that was born of idealism and it was born of hope. Some of the people at that time had a theological position that they actually believed that what was going to happen in our country was that through this country, the millennial kingdom of God was going to be established. And they really felt that this was the chance that man had to build that kingdom. And if we would build it right, then Jesus Christ would return. They had a lot of idealism. One where freedom from oppressive government would allow people to flourish. And we have flourished as a country, haven't we? I mean, it's pretty amazing the things that we have done. We are arguably, and I say arguably because if you don't live here, maybe somebody else uh, might hear this and, and from another land and think, well, boy, you're being arrogant. But arguably, we are probably the greatest country on the face of the earth right now. I mean, when you think about it, we really are. Uh, we are the economic power that is running the earth. I, I understand that China is pretty big right now, but still, at this moment at least, when it comes to military might, we're one of the greatest countries in the world, bar none. We're a pretty big deal right now in the world. But what began in freedom in our country is beginning to change. It really is. Courts with the blessing of Congress, with no fear of any change of, of their decision, have been creating new rights and privileges out of basically thin air. Um, by fiat, they're, they're creating and, and discovering rights. In 1977, somehow the, the Supreme Court discovered uh, in the Constitution that a woman has to, a, a right to kill her unborn baby. In, in 1977, they discovered that, that right that hadn't been there previously, but it is evidently they, they found it in there. And this last Friday, it was discovered that the Constitution protects the right for anyone to marry anyone else, making homosexual marriage the law of the land. Yesterday, a court in Oregon upheld a decision to fine a baker $135,000 for refusing to bake a cake for a lesbian couple. $135,000. But not only that, this court imposed on these people a gag order. So not only are they fined $135,000, but they cannot talk about the case to anyone for fear of being in contempt of court and actually serving prison time. So they can't do any more interviews or anything like that. So in one fell swoop, they got rid of free speech, the exercise of religion, and they canceled their business. Yeehaw. The state of freedom in our country is in deep trouble right now. But we really shouldn't be surprised at this. We really shouldn't be shocked at this. Every time man gets something a little bit right, we always screw it up. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, every time we get just a little bit of freedom and, and we just start getting things going right and, and then we, we have a, a way of, of seeming to mess it up. I mean, the children of Israel did it over and over and over and over and over again. You can read about it. They would repent, they would turn their hearts back to God, and they would, they would start moving on the right path, and God would begin to bless them, and then they would just blow it, and you're just kind of wondering, where did that come from? That's exactly what our country is doing. I was particularly disappointed in the Supreme Court case, and I was completely not surprised. I was disappointed, but I was not surprised. God will not be mocked. We will reap what we sow as a country. And, and that's not some prediction of doom or something like that, but I, I just know that that's the way it works. God will not be mocked. And it's difficult for me to not be pessimistic and somehow cynical about where we're headed as a country because it's not a good place. And, and I, I really work with that. 
And when I kind of thought about what am I going to share on, on July 4th, what are we going to, well, I'm, I'm really not in the mood to celebrate. In fact, about Tuesday, I was telling Susan, I, I'm just down. I, I'm just feeling down. And I, I was really, you know, I, I was looking through my file cabinet for what have I preached on other 4th of Julys? And, and, and I was looking at, man, there's got to be something encouraging that I can bring to you. But I think it's important that we just, you know, look at the state of things and realize that everything's not perfect and everything's not glorious and rosy and maybe it's, it's going down a path that's not very positive, really. And I wonder in my mind how much longer I'm going to actually be able to celebrate this great country. But ultimately, I cannot let negativity and, and fear overrule all of this. So yes, there's some, some really negative things and some really terrible things that are going on in our country, and it's headed down a, the wrong path. But today, I don't want to focus on that, even though I want to acknowledge it, because really, that's where my heart is. My heart is in two places. On the one hand, I want to acknowledge that these things are going on, because I just can't ignore them. But on the other hand, I don't want to let them overwhelm everything that I do today. And I don't want them to overwhelm what it is we are as a country because there are still some great things that are going on here. There's some great things that we can actually celebrate. So rather than focus on the negative trend and direction, I want us today to praise God for some of the things that we can celebrate in our country, some of the good things, some of the freedoms we still have. The first freedom that we still can celebrate is the freedom to worship. In Daniel chapter 3, we have a, a story of some Israelites who were in a foreign country. They were taken to Babylon. They were taken away, and, and they were being oppressed. They had lost the battles. They were no longer in charge of their own self, and they were in captivity. But here's what happened. A, a herald of their government proudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of a horn, a flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship him will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and all kinds of music, all the nations and all the peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that, named, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, it's amazing that this king had this incredible, it was nine feet wide and almost 60 feet tall of gold statue. And these people would carry it around. I don't know if they had a cart for it or what, but whenever they did. And then the music came and it said all the peoples of all the nations. Well, that's because these guys had gone out and conquered all the nations around them and they got these people back as slaves. And so whenever they heard the music and they heard that and they saw the golden image, they were supposed to bow down and worship this image. That is what they were supposed to do. It's not always been the case that the people of God were free to worship just any way they wanted. In this instance, if one were not willing to worship then the king, then they would be, be killed. They would be thrown into this blazing furnace. In China, the underground churches have uh, experienced this for years and years. Where the government it says, listen, you, you can't just worship any way you want. If you're in China, you can have a church in China. As long as you are registered with the government agency that oversees churches, and you go to the one seminary that China has, where not only is the gospel of Jesus Christ taught there, but also the communist government and all those other things are mixed in with it. So it turns out that you can have a church in China, but it's a pretty polluted church. And so consequently, there are still these underground churches that are happening in China and growing, and there's crosses and things like that that are being put up. But then China every once in a while will crack down. It depends on which province you're in. And you can read the stories about how these guys will come in and they will tear down the crosses. And there's memos that have gone out to the people saying, listen, if you ever see a cross, tear it down. We put them up and take them down for decoration. We have people wear them on little necklaces and earrings. 
There, they put them up as a sign of defiance to a government and allegiance to a Savior. They know what it's like to not have the freedom to worship, to not have the freedom. In the Islamic states around the world, Christians are being persecuted and beheaded. One of the reasons why so many people are getting out of Libya, I mean, they're getting on boats and trying to paddle across the Mediterranean, and and a bunch of them are dying and things like this, is because ISIS has come in there and they are killing Christians all over the place. There's not a week that goes by that you don't see this happening somewhere in the world. Even Saudi Arabia, which is our ally, it's illegal to be a Christian. It's illegal to share your faith. It's illegal to worship. They can't just go out and set up a church. They can't go in a park and sing songs to Jesus Christ. Not a chance. They'll be thrown out. In Iran, if you convert to Christianity, you will be imprisoned. You will be tortured. You will be killed. In North Korea, if you are a Christian and you begin to spread the word, if you begin to tell people about the Bible or give out a Bible. And these places, they're all afraid of Christianity because they see what happens when people are actually free. And so they're persecuting them. But here in the United States, we're still free. We're able to worship. We even advertise our church services. I mean, that's just unheard of in some of these places. They, they would be just awestruck that we can advertise our church services. The, the biggest advertisement that they get to have is maybe they bump into somebody in the coffee line and say, hey, next week we're having the birthday party at Joe's house. And everybody knows it's not Joe's birthday. But they're going to get together and talk about Jesus Christ and the Word of God, and they're going to pray together. What a freedom we have to worship in this country. So this 4th of July, there might be all these things that are going on all around us that are negative and and that are maybe kind of headed down the wrong direction, and, and we can just acknowledge those, but the one thing we can certainly praise God for when we see the fireworks going up and they're exploding in the air, not in our grass, and we're seeing that, we can say, praise God. We have the freedom to worship in this place. Thank you, God, for the blessing on our people and on our our life and on our church that we have the freedom to worship. The government doesn't step in and tell me what songs I have to sing. The government doesn't say what day I have to meet. They don't do any of those things. We're still free to worship. There's a second freedom we can celebrate today, and that is the the freedom to share the gospel. The freedom to share the gospel. Remember the story in Acts chapter 5? The disciples had begun to teach and share, and this was after Jesus had resurrected, and they were kind of having an impact. And so the Sadducees were really kind of ticked off at this because they saw this as maybe this undercurrent that was going to throw them out of power. That was really the only thing that the Sadducees cared about was being in power. They were the people that were in charge of the temple, and they were the people who had made compromises with the Romans so that they could stay in political power. And that was their big deal. And they saw this offshoot of Judaism, they understood it, as a cult of Christianity, and they were afraid that it would take away their, their power. And so they took some of the disciples, they'd put them in prison, but an angel let them out. I love that. Angels just kind of let them out. Hey, sneak out here. And where did they go when they got left out? They went right back to the temple and they began to teach. And here's the the story in verse 25. And then someone came and said, look, and they, they were talking to the Sadducees, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. It was a dicey situation, but they, they got them back. And the the apostles were brought and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. 
We must obey God rather than human beings. It's not just in ancient times where people are confronted with that kind of a situation, is it? I read a story of some folks in Laos, which is a, is a small country kind of close to Vietnam. And the story I read were about how when these people began to share Jesus Christ, that the provinces were, the people that were in these provinces were really determined to try and eliminate Christianity from their province. And so they actually had reports that are coming out and they're fragmented and they talk about how this person or that person uh, was identified. And, and once they were identified as the people who were sharing Jesus Christ, they were detained. Now usually what would happen is if somebody was detained, they would be brought to a local prison and then in the local prison they would determine whether the charges were uh, appropriate or not. And then they would uh, you know, take, if they were appropriate charges, they would take them to a big prison. But what's going on now is that anybody who's caught proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and sharing the name of Jesus Christ is actually being brought to the really big provincial prisons in Laos. Just skipping all the, stu- the small stuff and taking them right to the big prisons. And a lot of them don't come out of those prisons. The person is quoted as saying this, the officials seem determined to eliminate Christianity from the province. Local sources told, in one case, police on June 6th arrested a pastor identified by the single name of Asa and following reports that he had encouraged many people to sing you know, in the Sing district to accept Christ. Wow. He was arrested as a pastor because he had, had encouraged a lot of people to, to accept Jesus Christ. Guilty. Right? Guilty. In the United States of America, so far we are still free to hold public worship services and in those services, encourage people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's something to celebrate. That's not true in every place in the world. In fact, that's not true in a lot of places in the world. And it may not always be true here, but for today it's true. Amen? Today we can celebrate. Today when the bombs burst in midair, we can say, thank you, Jesus, because I can share the gospel with anyone. I can have Bible studies and openly read and encourage people with the Word of God. Even the bits that aren't politically correct, I'm still able to encourage people with those. As of 2015, that is still the case. And we shouldn't minimize this at all. We should not be something we forget. It should not be something we take for granted because what a privilege it is to have that right, to have that freedom. And God has placed us in this. And you know, the amazing thing is is that when God gives gifts to His people, He has expectations on those gifts. Do you ever see that? I mean, it's the, the parable of the talents. He gave those talents. He gave that money to, those, to His manager. And He says, I want you to utilize this Take this money that I've given you and multiply it because I will hold you accountable for that. You see, I think when somebody from Laos who's a Christian gets into the kingdom of God and God, and they were standing before the great white throne, right? They've already been, we we already talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? The, The millennial kingdom's over and they're standing before God in their resurrected body and, and God is rewarding the saints for the things they've done in their life. And he says, to this person from Laos. Wow. You didn't share the gospel with very many people, but you shared it with one. But in doing that, you risked your life, your family's life. That's amazing. I gave you, you were in this situation that was really hard, and yet you took that, and you took that little situation that was really hard, and you shared it with one person. But what's he going to say to us? As we were standing before God, he's saying, listen, you not only had the gospel, you had the word in every single language you can imagine available on your iPhone. And I gave you the gospel and I said, spread it out to the world. And nobody was interfering with you and no government was interfering with you. Nothing. You had no hindrances. And you didn't share it with anybody. Wow. 
Sometimes we, we take it for granted, this incredible freedom that we have in this place. We take it for granted, the incredible blessing that God has poured out on us, that we're free to share the gospel. Not like most of the people in the world. I think we've got to take that seriously and celebrate that we're free to share the gospel. Uh, the best way to celebrate is share the gospel, amen? We've got to celebrate that. And, and there's one last freedom that I want to, that, that we can celebrate today. The freedom to pray. Freedom to pray. Remember the story of Daniel? Daniel was another one of those people that was taken away. And he was in captivity. But when he was in captivity, he was a fairly bright fellow, and he, he got along in captivity just fine. In fact, the Lord was with him, and he learned things better than all the people that he had, had learned with. Uh, he went to their schools and their universities, and, and uh, the, some of their schools were schools of sorcery and, and things like that. And Daniel outdid them all. He was better at them all, and God blessed him in that. It was an amazing thing. He was a wise man in their culture. And as a result of that, he was put into charge of things. And as a result of that, he had political enemies. And this is a story about his political enemies. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king. And they said, may Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, and advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict to and enforce this degree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it into writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now then Daniel learned that the decree had been published and he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem and three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about the royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. And then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, he pays no attention to you, your majesty, or the decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. And you know the rest of the story. His political enemies had surrounded Daniel and they'd figured out a way to get him. And what they had did is they, they set up a system where he would be persecuted for his prayer. He'd be persecuted for his prayer and for praying. And even though the king didn't want to do it, he still ended up having to do it. And he was thrown into the lion's den. And an angel of the Lord closed the mouths of the lions so that Daniel wasn't harmed by them or hurt by them. I, I don't know about you, but I always wondered if Daniel tested that. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I just wonder if he thought, you can't eat me. I wonder if I could pet you. <laughs> just try it out a little bit. I always wondered that. When I get in the kingdom of God, I'm going to ask Daniel. But the, the interesting thing is that the, the lions didn't harm him in any sense, in any way. And the king was so worried, he didn't sleep through the night. And after it was over, Daniel came, he came back and he, he yelled down into where the lions were. And he said, hey, Daniel, are you still alive? And Daniel said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just hanging out with my lions. I'm sure that's in the translation somewhere. And he, and he brought him up. And then, because the Bible is so graphic, the king was so ticked off, he took all those leaders that had set up Daniel, and he threw them in the lion's den, and their wives, and their children. And it says the, they didn't hit the ground before the lions broke their bones. God doesn't deal nicely with enemies. You ever notice that? I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side. I mean, we, like to, we like to emphasize the pink baby Jesus. 
and a God that is all loving. People love to do that. But our God is a righteous and fearsome warrior. And that enemy of Daniel, it did not go well for them. It did not go well for them. Here's the thing. In our country, we still have the ability to pray to our God. We still have the ability to pray to our God. Nobody has said to us, you can't pray. I know they've said some things like, you can't pray uh, for football games before the football game. And they've said some of those things, but as we've recently determined that actually the separation of church and state is probably a pretty good idea. Amen? I mean, it, it ends up being a fairly decent idea because you never know where the state is going to go. It's not about, we're not worried about where the church is going to go so much, but we're really kind of a little bit concerned about where the state's going to go. In this case, they had to pray to the king. Who knows where, where we might go in the future, but for right now, we don't have to worry about that. We can pray to, to our Lord and our God openly and ask for His blessing and His provision on our life. And if there was ever a time that our country needed Christians uh, that are in this country to pray for it, now would be that time. Amen? They need Christians to fall down on our face and ask God to begin to heal our nation and to begin to heal us so that we might reach into these communities of all these broken people that our society is creating. And that we might continue to be effective at doing that. We need prayer as a country. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3 says this, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those that are in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Sometimes it's difficult to know what to pray, isn't it? Sometimes we, we pray, and, and I will confess, I, I may be terrible at this, that, that sometimes I pray, God, this is so ugly, just knock them out, just destroy them, get rid of this, move them and, and make them ineffective and let them fall down. And, and, and I, I look to the prayers of David and Saul in Psalms that he prayed against his enemies. We, we're not very good at that. It's in the Word of God, so I feel okay about it until I read 1 Timothy. He says we need to pray for the kings and we need to pray for the rulers all the time. And his reason was this, that if we live in a time of peace, we'll be able to rescue people and save them. You see, the, the thing about it is, is that if we are praying for our country, and yes, it might be going down the wrong path, and yes, it might, things might be getting bad, but here's the thing, we need to pray for it. Why? Because we still have an opportunity to save more people. So even though it's headed the wrong direction, that's okay. We're probably not going to change that, not in this life. But still there's freedom that we can go out and we can rescue more people. So we should pray for our leaders that we live in peace. So we can rescue more and rescue more. In every single level of our government, we need to be praying for those people. Many of them are not godly people. They're not Christian in any sense of the word. They need our prayer. They need our prayer. So here's three applications that, that I want you to do. Three things that I just want you to do, steps that you can take for this week, as, as you're celebrating tonight, as you're watching the fireworks, celebrate the fact that we're free to worship. Celebrate that. That is a beautiful thing. Let it encourage you. Every time you're able to drive through down that driveway and come in these doors and there's not a big sign that says closed by government decree, celebrate God and say, praise the Lord, we live in a place where we're free to worship. We should thank God for that with our heart, joyfully thanking Him. Celebrate the fact that you're free to share the gospel with anyone you please. Anyone you please. You could leave this place right now and go exercise your freedom to share the gospel with 150 people before the sun went down. You could do it. You could do that. You have that freedom. We should celebrate that. The greatest way to celebrate is to actually go out and do it. It's to bring up Jesus Christ in our conversations. It's to take this a wonderful gift that we've been given and actually spread it out 
unlike the people of Laos where they're arrested for sharing Jesus Christ and put in prisons and never come out. Unlike the people of North Korea that never have the opportunity to share Jesus Christ. If they know of him, they keep it secret. Not us. So celebrate that we can share the gospel with anyone and exercise that freedom. Exercise that freedom and finally celebrate because we are free to pray. Pray for our leaders. Pray in public. Pray with people that are hurting. We go to hospitals and we pray. If you're in an accident scene and you pray, people appreciate it. If you are there, you pray. We are free to pray. So let's celebrate it by praying. So I'd ask that you join me right now because we're going to just ask God's blessing on this country and thank Him for the incredible freedoms we have. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank You. I want to praise You. Yes, sometimes our country is hard to be in. But as I look around the world, where else would I want to be? Lord, You've placed us here, and what a blessing it is, because here we can read in Your Word that we are not citizens of this place, but truly we're citizens of Your kingdom, which is coming. And yet, even now, even in this imperfect and broken place, we're free. We're free to worship You. We're free to share Your gospel with the world. And we're free to pray. So I pray for our country just now. Lord, as we've marked a tipping point, if we've marked a turning point, and we're headed down the wrong way, Lord, I pray that Christians all over this country would be on our knees in prayer and lift up the leaders and the, the politicians. And we would pray, Lord, that the evil one would be bound, that the corruption would be, would be hindered, and that, Lord, righteousness would prevail as much as it can. And I pray, Lord, for all the Christians and all the churches that are celebrating the freedom of the 4th of July, that we are not oppressed, that, Lord, they would be lifted up and encouraged. Encourage them by your Spirit, that we would not lose hope. Your gospel is the same gospel, and it's still effectively saving people. Your word is still your word, and it will never fall to the ground as untrue. And your rescue is on its way. You've already rescued us from our sin, and your kingdom is coming. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. But I pray, Lord, that the Christians around this country would not forget those things and that they would be encouraged and they would pray even more. So I thank you, God, today for these freedoms. I thank you for the celebration, the opportunity we have to celebrate them. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we celebrate. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.